Are we on? Yes, we are. There's still people trying to fit in. Happy to see all of you here. Uh, this is like the weirdest room that I've ever had a session in because you're honestly all sitting so up high that it looks like you're all falling down from there. But try to keep to your seats. Uh, this session is about what's new in Windows 10. My name is Sami Laiho. I'm from Finland. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I train anything related to Microsoft. I train anything related to Windows operating system or Active Directory. And um, some of you have been to my sessions before, so um, you all know that there's the old story of me being a senior technical fellow only because of Mark Rusinovich, because he's, he was only a technical fellow at Microsoft. And as I was trying to get it into TechEd, I needed to somehow make people remember me in the US as well. So I decided to just aim high and change my title to senior technical fellow. So now everyone in the US is asking who's the young guy who's already a senior technical fellow, as Mark Rusinovich is only a technical fellow. I honestly had no idea if Mark Rusinovich even knows who I am. I'm super happy to see the other Mark here sitting in the front row, but uh, we've got a few common interests with Mark Minassi, so I know he knows me, but uh, the other Mark I wasn't so sure about. So as la last year was my second year in TechEd, so I'm a newbie there anyway. You have to know that the most satisfying email I've ever received in my whole life is something that I have to show you in a second. It's going to tell you the whole story about Mark Rusinovich. I can't start a session without always talking about my dear language back home. Someone yesterday asked me when I talked on the phone that what, it actually might have been Mark, who asked me that what happened to you guys that you actually just ended up in the middle of Scandinavia with the only language that has nothing in common with the rest of them? I'm still kind of sure it has to be something to do with aliens or something, because the beam is so exactly on Finland. But um, people started asking me about this because I started giving out these t-shirts to Microsoft executives in the US that had the Finnish word for administrator on the t-shirt. And that's why they start asking me questions all the time. So now I, wherever I go, I'm trying to tell everyone that it's not that hard. So for example, if you think about English as a language, if you would say, I wonder if I should run around aimlessly, that would require you to use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words. As in Finnish, we only need one. <laughs> That's it's so much simpler than any other language in the world. It doesn't really require those huge amounts of words. Just use one. That's Juaksenteli Singko Han, which is just a really common way, really, really common word in Finland. Anyway, about the email which I was talking about. So what did Mark do to me? I'm, I'm all, Mark's always picking on, no, I'm always picking on Mark, but I didn't know if he knew me. And now, we were in Barcelona a few months ago for TechEd Europe, and I sent out this email to people from US that I knew that if they would like to join me for a dinner. And Mark Rusinovich was included. So if you know, Mark is no more a technical fellow at Microsoft. He's now the chief technical officer of Microsoft Azure. So then I got a reply with two lines huge importance to me. This is from Mark. So, thanks for the invite, Sam. But I've got a couple of sessions Friday that I'll need to prep for that evening, so I have to pass. By the way, my title has changed from technical fellow to chief technical officer of Microsoft Azure. Might be the time to update yours. <laughs> she knows who I am. And just to keep picking on Mark, I instantly went to LinkedIn and changed myself to senior chief technical <laughs> officer. So I have to keep up with the competition here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, 
anyway, a few projects. I'm not going to be going through those. You can find my blogs. These will be recorded. That's why they're on there, so you can find them later on. Um, nothing's for sure. So what we're going to go through is a... I'm try, I've been asked to deliver a 60-minute session that would somehow try to fit in everything that's new in Windows 10, which is totally impossible, so we decided to divide it into two. There's one with everything else, and then there's one with security. Okay? So there's two sessions. Um, what we're going to talk about here is going to be quite quick-based. Based. You can ask me all the questions you want when you find me during tonight, for example. Uh, this is something that I might not be wise to say on recorded session, but uh, <laughs> I've been traveling quite a lot, and I somehow forgot that I'm having a two-week vacation in Thailand, leaving tomorrow from Helsinki <laughs> with my wife and kids. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I had a session for tomorrow. So if, if you scheduled for my session tomorrow, I had to ask them to reschedule it for today, because I called my wife and told, told her that I'm going to uh, be back in Helsinki Friday night at 8, and she said, no, you won't. I said, Why? Because we're leaving at 7 p.m. to Thailand for two weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm leaving <laughs> tomorrow morning, 8-something, <laughs> so I'll be back home at 11, and we only leave at 7, so I have time to pack. And so the other session, not tomorrow, today, okay? So, first of all, we start with the basics of Windows 10. Windows 10 is going to come out with two main versions. So there's going to be a Windows 10 for, let's say, desktops. The final name might be whatever. That's meant to be used on any device that has a screen of 8 inches or bigger. And then there will be a Windows 10 Mobile, which is meant to be used on not only phones, but any devices that are 7 inches or below. So the difference being that Microsoft this perhaps changing their way more to the competitor's way of using the phone as an operating system also on small devices and slates rather than using the big Windows 10. Um, Office 2016 will be released this year, hopefully, on the second half. Uh, there's, also, there's already some previews, of course, available, but the official launch should be then. And the one thing I'm really sad about, because I thought they got this fixed, that they would always come up with... Uh, builds that were for both workstations and servers, but now they're going to miss that again. So although they did a nice job with that with Windows 7, 8, 8.1, now they're back to the old game, which means that the server will be skipping to 2016. So there will be only Windows 10 announced this year, and the server for Windows 10 will be announced next year. And we just started year 2015, so next year gives us a time period of almost two years. The current build, if you've downloaded the current build of Windows 10, there were some features that were asked. So just a quick review of what's there. We're going to go through these, but just if you want to have a reference point on what actually is on the new build. First of all, the version number has changed to 10 finally. We've got the new start menu. We can change uh, usage scenarios from tablet to desktop with Continuum. There's a new settings app. Uh, we've got easier installation for wireless audio and video with Bluetooth. Photos and Maps applications have been replaced. Xbox has a new app. There's a new store, beta app, so a different store. Now you have two stores. One that's working currently and one that's in beta. Uh, Office Universal Apps Preview released a week ago or something like that. Uh, more languages, Finnish included, one of the main languages in the world. Um, new Windows update, alt-tap reverted, meaning that people were complaining that they changed alt-tap to perhaps look a bit more like it used to look in Vista, so they changed it back. There's a Persian calendar, because everyone needs it, obviously. Um, File Explorer can change default folders, and we have a full screen button. Most of these are based on the feedback from what Win Microsoft now calls the Windows Insiders Group. Something like 1.5 million people now enrolled to Windows Insiders to get the newest builds. No for Spartan. If you didn't know the story behind, Microsoft loves this um, Halo world. So the, if you think about Halo, the names that are the new... The features are two new features that they have on 
the names come from Halo both. So Spartan is from Halo and Cortana is from Halo. So both are from there. But that's not on the new build and OneDrive didn't get fixed. If everyone, if someone doesn't know, they totally broke OneDrive with the last build and they didn't fix it yet. I could talk about that for a long time because honestly there are some good things behind the decision of not using it like it used to work in Windows 8.1. But we get back to that a bit later on. So, bold move from Windows. Now they're going to change finally the version number from Windows. It's not 6.4 anymore, now it's 10.0 in the latest build. There's two things if you look, out, look at WinWare, which is Windows version, so there's two th things that should be of interest. One is the version number, so it's now 10.0. Uh, a bold move, well not that bold, because actually the operating system is full of shims anyway. So anyone who asks for a version number which is something that's not like built into Windows, it'll anyway reply with the version number of Windows 7 actually. So it's not that bold, but they have to like, if they're gonna use this as the final Windows version that will just get updated and never change the version, then they're just gonna have to do this. People are getting upset that they don't have the guts to update the numbers. And expiry date is only 2nd of October, so there's a lot of time to work with that. Licensing. It'll be a free upgrade for the first year for Windows 7, 8 and 8.1 users. Anyone can get it free. Uh, even Microsoft, up to the highest level of their executives, is now using the term officially of Windows as a service. But it does have nothing to do with um, like the business model of Microsoft. So they're not changing Micro they're not changing Windows 10 to be a subscription-based thing that you just pay monthly but they are going to be upgrading it with new features instead of coming out with new operating system versions all the time. Enterprise licenses are not entitled to free upgrades. Most of you that have enterprise, client, uh, enterprise licenses should have SA agreements, especially if you ask Microsoft, so that would guarantee you to get the new version anyway for free. But Microsoft did change something just a year ago, which is that they actually started selling enterprise licenses without SA. So those of people that are running enterprise versions to get direct access, for example, Windows 7, it was easy. You could always go to the shop and buy an ultimate version and get direct access. But Windows 8, somehow, like, they kind of missed the spot. They're, like, suddenly people started asking, so how do we get direct access on Windows 8? Go to enterprise. No, no, but we don't have an SA agreement. Well, you go to the... Yeah, and then it took them a year and then they came up with the new model of ordering Windows Enterprise separately without an SA. So those will not be entitled for a free upgrade. What about Windows RT? Don't you just love the Microsoft executives changing their <laughs> mind like totally <laughs> from year to year? It was like two MVP summits ago when uh, we were in Redmond and um, Panos whose last name I do not remember, who runs the whole Surface thing at Microsoft. He was there and you can see him going like, Windows RT, that's the most secure thing you will ever find and it'll be a superb and we will never get rid of it. Well, somehow the audience seemed to disagree. And uh, Windows RT didn't sell that well. And now what they promised is that Windows RT users are not left behind. So Windows RT, because it requires a different operating system. I mean a different build of the operating system. Anyway, so it is a lot of work for Microsoft to support both ARM-based and the Intel-based platforms. So now what they are promising is to get some of the Windows 10 features. How will that be done? The disclaimer in the beginning, this is guesswork. I'm guessing. I'm not an official employee. I can't tell you official opinions. But my guess is that if you look at group policy settings, it should have a clue what they're going to do. Because if you look at Windows 10 settings, which are meant for Windows 10, they actually say on the requirements line that it at least requires Windows 8.1 update 2, which there is no official word that that would ever be done. They said that they will give features from Windows 10, but I would guess that's the way they're going to do it. So Windows RT will get a Windows 8.1 update too, 
which will get the smaller start menu. And other people are going with Windows 10. So they kind of can say that they're not leaving this audience behind. But that's just guessing. SKUs. Nothing said yet. Good guess, basic pro enterprise. Lucky guess might be, have no idea. What we already know is that the bigger picture will be the, divide, uh, the dividing the operating system to two Windows 10 desktop and Windows 10 mobile. That I already said. New devices, hell yes. Uh, next year, this will be easier for me. I can go to Thailand because I'll be here as a hologram and I'll be talking to you and you'll be wearing your holo lenses, everyone, because they will be given free by the Conferno. Uh, probably not, anyway. And I'll be hosting it from my 84-inch Surface Hub back home. Or then I'll just do the opposite and I'll be here partying with you and leave the hologram back home with my wife. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this would make the thing that I believe quite many of us have been wondering about how to actually achieve, it, which would be to kind of duplicate ourselves. So those are way cool. I have already put in my, I, I met my MVP lead yesterday and I have already requested that I would be changed from a Windows Expert IT Pro MVP to HoloLens MVP, at least for a year. I can switch back then, but I would like to be a HoloLens MVP. I have no idea how holograms work, but I learn. When you got the will, <laughs> you learn. Uh, Johan is doing deployment. Like, there's sessions about this. So this is a super brief. As I was asked to have the new features in, this is important. But if you want to talk more about uh, deployments, I don't know if Johan is running a class right now. I'm not sure if he did it already, or a session, I mean, so quickly. Hardware requirements will be about the same as Windows 7. Some features excluding, of course. So there's Secure Boot, for example. Secure Boot does require UEFI. There's TPM requirements for stuff like BitLocker. There's UEFI requirements for stuff like uh, BitLocker network locking. So you might need a newer hardware to add this few features, but basically if we're talking about the old stuff like CPU, RAM, hard disk, those would be equal to Windows 7. Software compatibility is same as Windows 7, so you can run the software that was running on Windows 7. That's kind of um, halfway through, because if you think about Windows 7 compared to Windows 8.1, companies sa Microsoft said that companies can just upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 8.1 in place and everything will work, including the apps. Well, everything did not work, so it's not 100%. So I'd, I'd say this is still a uh, promise where as long as we get to see how it actually works. I'm quite confident about the compatibility between Windows 8.1 and Windows 10. That seems to be working very nice and I'm really happy with it. But if we're talking about changing from Windows 7 up to 10, I want to see it before I believe it. Uh, most of the, a lot of the stuff that's in the application compatibility toolkit to gather information from your network is actually now implemented in the operating system as uh, its operating system itself. So there's WMI classes to gather information and inventory data of software, software versions, installation dates, stuff like that. So hopefully we could do the same thing that we had to install ACT for. Um, I've only played around with a few of those, so I honestly haven't gotten that much information and I still need some inventory to put my own opinion about something. If, if I get information on what kind of software we have, I, I do need something to input it in so I can say that this has been tested for x86 and x64. Checkbox, checkbox stuff. Minor tweaks to bare metal deployment should work almost like it did before. There's some tweaks on the Windows PE, for example, you can do like branch caching for Windows PE thingies, so you can um, you can get a proc, let, you can get a um, like a cache of installation media on a site running Windows PE. But basically, the op actual process works like the same. Now the biggest and most interesting thing that I thought I would never hear from Microsoft is that now all enterprises are suggested to use in-place upgrades only. 
So all Windows 7, all Windows 8.1 in place upgrade. Started from SCCM, for example, as a software installation and just in place upgrade everything. And that's the suggested one. If you think about ever before, they said that this might be possible, but you will always end up with a better performing operating system if you do a clean wipe reload thingy. So that's really weird. New builds are available through Windows Update, so we get new features and companies can choose different levels of uh, speed, how fast they want to take this into their environments so they can be fast and get all the features now, but be willing to have perhaps a little bit more training to do all the time and perhaps a little bit more bugs maybe. And of course, they can also go with the slower one so that people will test them out first and then they will just take them on the enterprise network later. So Microsoft is, of course, heavily relying on home user testing in this scenario, meaning that now it would mean that the home users test the features, then the fast enterprises can take them. When they've been testing it for half a year, for example, then the next step is for the slower ones to take them. And of course, you can deny totally. Um, probably the <coughs> kind of coolest thing if you ask me, it's the last one. So Windows ICD was just announced on um, 29th of January. I remember that very well because Michael Niehaus, although usually he does favors for me, this time the favor was quite funny because I had a one day seminar about Windows 10 deployment in Finland on the 30th of January. So Michael Niehaus sends an email 10 p.m. on the 28th that here's your ADK, go and play with it. Like, okay, and then just staying up all night and trying to figure out how it works and then start talking to people like, yeah, well, I've been using this ADK for a long time and it seems to work like this. So, uh, honestly, it's only been out there for a few weeks, still playing around with it. Uh, they've got a lot of work to do. It Honestly, it has bugs, bugs, bugs. A lot of them, if you start playing with, with it, just give them some slack. Hopefully, they will get up, uh, get a new one out there quickly. Um, it has a tool called Windows ICD, which can be used to transform a Windows port from a shop to an enterprise Windows. So instead of reinstalling the Windows, you will have a script or an XML file that will change the computer to be enterprise compliant, which would mean change the SKU to enterprise, remove crapware, a lot of it, usually, and install software, install certificates, install MDM agent, so whatever to take it into the company's control. Sounds cool. I've done that like 10 years ago for Windows XP. In my own company, we needed to be able to just take an XP from any shop and transform it to a company. So, but that was done with our own scripts totally, so a huge work behind it. So I'm happy that they're doing something like this. So. If you look at, if you, if you read like Johan's Twitter, you can see he's playing around it, playing around with it a lot more and he's got stuff there that like it works like a charm to change the enterprise skew on there. Few time zone thingies, but like 80% of the stuff does, doesn't seem to work. And like someone said, it probably has the most horrifying user interface ever, which is amazing if you think about what uh, w sim looks like Windows System Image Manager. That's like the ugliest thing you've ever seen, and this way beats it. It's <laughs> horrifying. That's just a screenshot of it, but there's like no clue how it works. And there's a help file, but that's it for now. So there's no other documentation that but the CHM file. So you can add email accounts, you can e add certificates, you can do even other, than, uh, even other than Office 365 or Exchange. So there's a lot of stuff you can configure with it. Normal bare metal like before, if you want to go home and try this out, you do it like before. Install, upgrade, install additional software you need, language packs, whatever you want to have on your image, sysprep, capture, deploy. Everything works like before. Biggest difference is that if you want to do an in-place upgrade, you, nothing else is supported except the golden image from Microsoft. 
that kind of makes sense if you think about it, that there's a, you've got an operating system which has like uh, 45 different software installed and Microsoft promises that they will change the windows behind the scenes without breaking your software. If you would take an image that would have Office 2013 in it and you tried to put that on a computer that already has Windows 7 with Office 2007 on it, so to put those together without breaking software would be impossible in this case. So they only support the golden image that they give you. That's the only thing that can be used with uh, in-place upgrades. There's a lot of sessions about management in Nick as well. So that's not the thing I'm going to go for that much. But what we're going to aim for with Windows, what not, I can't say what we are going to aim for. What Microsoft's going to aim for with Windows 10 is a lot more management capabilities with MDM. You still have the same basic options. You can th have the really lightly managed computers with only exchange policies, for example, exchange active sync policies. So just like lock your computer, get a pin code, get a password, stuff like that, but nothing else, a really light one. Or you can have the really highly controlled enterprise way like you did before. So you would be using system center and active directory group policies to be really tight how you want to manage it. But What's between these two is the biggest growth with Windows 10. So that's the, that's the room for MDM. So anything between this. You can do MDM. MDM was mainly used... With Windows 8.1, Microsoft meant MDM mainly to be used for bring your own device scenarios, mobile devices like phones. But now they're aiming MDM to be able to control also enterprise computers, not only mobile devices. So that's a totally different perspective. PowerShell 5. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, if you can hear my voice breaking apart a bit, that's because I've actually been having a horrible fever for the last few days. So if I start talking weird stuff, that's just the temperature rising now. Um, I'm training a lot of speakers as well in Finland. First thing I tell them every time is, that if you go in front of an audience, you have to teach what you love and you have to love what you teach, or at least you have to be able to fool yourself into thinking that you love what you teach. And um, I made this horrible mistake in Tech Mentor. Luckily, Mark was running from another conference, barely making it to his session, so he didn't see my session before his, because I made a huge mistake there. I had my PowerShell prompt on screen, but it didn't say PS, something, it said LH, something. And I got almost through the whole session before someone asked me, how come your PowerShell prompt says LH? It should say PS. I do a lot of stuff wrong in front of audiences, but I usually do it by intention because I usually teach troubleshooting. So I look like I'm messing something up, but it's intentional. You will know when I start doing demo effects because that's when my ears go red. I can't do anything about it. It's, I, I can't do anything about it. They just turn red and two front rows will start sweating. So it's a, the thing was that at that point, four rows were sweating because of my ears going so red because I honestly did the biggest mistake, which was to show a demo on my production machine and not with my demo account, but with my own. And I used to call PowerShell, not PowerShell, but lower hell. So I always had LH at my PowerShell because it was lower hell for me. It's like, I will never go there. But that was, you know, that's like seven years ago. That was the time when all the exchange guys got cool tools and I didn't get any with, as I, I was an OS guy. Now I get a lot. If you get PowerShell 5, install the basic infrastructure services on the new server, to the technical preview. So let's say DNS, DHCP, for example. Active Directory Domain Services, Certificate Services. So basic infrastructure services, and you're up to, uh, depending on how you count, from 3,500 up to 6,000 different commands. Command line itself has about 600, which has stayed about the same. So there's a lot to do with it. 
I still have to do some, uh, take some time for myself before sessions. So like here, I came here luckily early. I fixed everything up and then I went to the toilet. Take time for myself. <laughs> no, I actually went there and started talking to myself that PowerShell is actually really good and I like it and I love it. And I'm quite good at convincing myself now because I actually seem to be liking it. It took me a few years to make it happen, but now I really do like it because there's so much stuff that I can't do without it. It used to be that I can choose. The, I, I think it was Mark who did the PowerShell IP config thingy that I saw in US. So that's, um, that's a, like a good thing. If, if, I, if I think about it, someone calls me and I start panicking. So if my wife calls me and I start panicking, I have to reply something Instead of replying, go to CMD, type IP config and tell me what you see. But instead I would say, start PowerShell, type get net IP address and tell me what you see. That, you, you feel the thing? It takes a while. Something is like built into your spine. You've done that for years and years and years. But now it is time to learn that new stuff. So PowerShell 5, I'm not the guy to talk about PowerShell. I've got a slide for you here. You can go to the TechNet slide see what there is, they are here. I'm not gonna spend that much time, but I'm quite sure it's better than ever before. That's the best I can do. Okay, now for the new features, not so quickie. Those were quickies, now we have half of the session left for the not so quick things. So more of the Windows 10 new features stuff. New start menu, they're changing it on every build. So the current build, now changes things again. So you cannot freely change start menu size anymore like you did with the previous build. Now you're stuck with two different sizes. So if you take a Windows 10 box from here, by default your Windows start menu looks like this. There's no way of resizing it like you did before. You only get the button of making it full screen. It's not like changing from start menu to start screen as you still have this left column here but it's more close to that setting. So it's either full screen or not. Nothing in between. People seem to be doing quite a lot of stuff with it. So putting it in the down below area only, looking like a band with different kinds of software. And it started to look a bit more like a competitor's product. So that's the thing. Well, I, I agree with Microsoft. If you give people the ability to change the form of the menu, that makes centralized management a horrifying thing to do. As long as you have only content that you manage, rather than managing like what size it would be and what if you change the, turn the device up and down and stuff like that. So it, it does add a lot of management on it. So. Let's play with this, but this is one of the biggest things they're looking for feedback now. Half of the people seem to like it like this, half the people want, to, want it to be resizable again. <laughs> How do we control this? So the main thing for many of you probably is anyway centralized management as we are at the infrastructure conference. So if you wanna manage it with group policies, it works basically the same as it did before. Only difference being that the export start layout command let now has options for start menu and options for start screen. And you have different policies that you apply those XMLs with. Will this only be an enterprise feature like it was with Windows 8.1? Nothing to disclose on that. I'm afraid it will, but hope not. So it's one of the weirdest things that to be able to administer centrally your start menu you need to have an SA agreement or buy an enterprise license that I think that's ridiculous because it's like a basic function of Windows. But that might be still the case. Continuum is now included. So we can change from a normal mode to a tablet mode. So you have a Windows 10 running so that it's meant to be used with a keyboard and mouse and then you have another way of using it with mainly touch. You can change that so if you go here and you remember in a previous Windows 8.1, for example, you had the charms menu here. Charms menu is not here anymore. <laughs> Someone, <laughs> I heard that. I agree. 
So uh, if you click on the notification center, it actually looks quite a lot like Windows Phone. So there's uh, things that you can actually add here. There's a lot more, and these can be customized. And there's also tablet mode, which can be changed. Tablet mode in this case doesn't really do that much, except changing, of course, the layout of the start screen. And now I can't put it back to small. So there's no minimizing it anywhere. But that, of course, the continuum term means that it should change, automa change automatically if you take your Surface Pro keyboard out. Notification Center gives you a lot of notifications for home users, like uh, here you can see some of my own social networks telling me about birthdays. You can react to these by clicking them and going to the social media <laughs> features. Now it's used for Windows Feedback as well. Windows OneDrive, you will get notifications like you did before, and now Microsoft, like always, pro uh, promises to you that you can actually control what you see and what you don't. It was kind of close in Windows 8.1 already that you actually could choose what to see and what not, but now they promise it again. Uh, you can make it go away, hide notifications for one hour, three hour, eight hours. You can have quiet times, say, like in, on phones and even on Windows 8.1. Uh, you can have quiet hours, so don't disturb me while I'm sleeping thingy. Um, that's basically it for the notification center. Cortana. I'm afraid I'm not available to help you in your region. That's like the weirdest thing ever is that Cortana doesn't speak Finnish at all. I don't understand that. But um, you can use Cortana. Uh, well, you can change your, just change your uh, country uh, settings pointing to US, so just cheat and try to use it. But in <laughs> honestly, here in Europe, it, the chick doesn't seem to be that wise. So and she's a little buggy, so you're not missing it. Yeah, she's a little buggy, especially if you want to see the bugginess. Try the feature. There's a setting for Cortana that you can wake her up by saying, hey, Cortana. If you use that, that that's cool. I've got an Xbox, Xbox back home. That, that's awesome, but like my six-year-old knows how to talk to Xbox. I really don't, but she's fluent with Xbox. And she talks to Xbox and Xbox does whatever she wants. But now <laughs> with Cortana, because Xbox, you can go to my living room and say, Xbox, turn on. So like, take a while, think what you were going to say. <laughs> but with Cortana, it's like a <laughs> speed race. Hey, Cortana, turn on now. So you'll have to just write a script for yourself first, and then you go, hey, Cortana, find all my emails that came into Monday through Thursday, from blah, 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 blah. and it might give it to you or not. Usually not. The horri most horrifying thing is that you, have to you can't take a break to think what you're going to talk your virtual assistant about. You have to say everything. Blah, blah, blah. Hope she executes. File Explorer. <laughs> Will they ever get this right? No, probably not. <laughs> Changing in every single window. So now you have a new way of adding your quick access buttons here. Uh, you are, of course, pointed a lot to OneDrive. You can customize this all. You can get your libraries back that were taken off in Windows 8.1. Of course, you could add them there as well, but there's a lot of options. The biggest two things that people, if you look at the Windows Insider feedback forums, Two biggest things people are asking for. One is File Explorer tabs. Uh, I've heard that there's a competitive product that has been able to do that for a while. So it shouldn't be impossible. And I would like it. I would like to have tabs for my Windows Explorer. That they haven't still implemented. I think they might because it's so high up the ladder. But what they did implement was this, <laughs> which is something that I wasn't even, I asked for it. Personally, I asked for it, but that's not what I meant. It's like, this always happens. Like, I personally went there and filed this. I think that many people, like hundreds and thousands of people had asked for as well. The ability to change where File Explorer opens to. Something that I would like to have done since Windows 2000. If I open Explorer, go here. And I want to tell you where to go. So now they announced, now it's fixed <laughs> with these two options. <laughs> you still can't do what I asked. I asked that I want to tell it where to go. No, you can choose from these two. 
hopefully this will be, the list will be a bit longer with the custom option on the bottom, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much for this Microsoft settings for the previous Windows versions, meaning 8.1. 8 the horrific place of trying to figure out what goes to control panel and what goes to settings. Now they've fixed it. At least they said they fixed it. So now you have a um, settings <coughs> option. So you, you, can, you can really go to settings, which is a modern application, as they say here. And da -da, they made it look, as they say, better organized, which in my case looks like the old one. But um, Anyway, so this should be now having everything. Well, I hope it will, because if you go and find settings for, let's say, BitLocker, you can see the fact that it's still doing what it did. So full of these old CPL thingies. So we're not there yet, but I hope that we honestly don't need to go to the old control panel at least. So you could find at least everything from here. And gradually they will make everything more modern. Snaps, I love this. I have a really small monitor here, so it doesn't really look that cool, but I love it. This is something, uh, small things which, if you think about Windows Vista, which probably you don't do that often, but if you do, uh, <laughs> Windows Vista was... Um, <laughs> it's not that common that I have Mark here. Again, still remember you having a keynote about Vista, because when Vista, the name came out, we were at Buena Vista. The place was called Buena Vista. And we were thinking, like, did they honestly want to bring us here to announce Vista to a place called Buena Vista? Like a good Vista? Uh, well, Vista had all sorts of things which were more graphical but didn't actually have any use to them. With Windows 7, things looked more ugly, but they actually implemented stuff that people were asking for. One thing I use a lot as I'm a trainer, I do PowerPoint slides, Virtual machine or virtual machine, Word document. Do exercises for my students. So stuff that I, this on here, this on here. So snaps in Windows 7 already are superb for me. So for example, if I do get the snaps like I did before, so halfway, halfway, I can now do corners, which might not be that big of a deal for someone, but when you honestly try to use this with a 24 inch or bigger monitor on your desk, you will love it. It makes total sense there. It's quickly, 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 quickly. Again, there might be a Mac user who's saying that like we've done that for 20 years, but hey, I'd rather have it than not have it. So even more, if you wanna have, uh, if you've got a lot of software open, there's actually something called the Snap Assistant. So if you snap something for example here, you actually get the Snap Assistant to ask you which one would you like to open next to it. Another feature that I do like. Small thing, it just honestly makes my work easier. And I like it. So, tiny, tiny detail, still of great importance for me. Uh, no idea what it's talking about. You might, be, might have, but I don't. So, snaps and snap assist. Task switcher and virtual desktops. So, now I have stuff here, but I'd like to distribute it on different things. <laughs> This sounds like Austin Powers, you know, because when Austin Powers wakes up from his frozen sleep forever, <laughs> whatever, and, and then he, he's faced with the guy, uh, I don't remember the evil doctor's name, Dr. Evil, maybe? Uh, anyway, and he starts to tell this like, I think we should threaten them with uh, something like, you know, there's this thing we, what, which we call the laser that could be used to cut a hole in the ozone layer. Like, yeah, that actually happened already. This feels like it. I was afraid when I heard that Microsoft said that Windows 10 will have virtual desktops. You know, you could virtualize your desktops. And luckily they didn't come out with this like that when they announced it, because you know what people would have said. Like, every single competitor has done this for 20 years. You've had a tool on sysinternals to do it. And your operating system, if you read the Windows internals book, actually 
tells the story of how it's implemented in the operating system and has been for a long time. But luckily they didn't. I was amazed when Joe Belfiore started talking. He was like, and then there's virtual desktops and then we'll go forward. They really, luckily for them, didn't make a big number out of it. But virtual desktops are now supported. So if you press Windows Tab, you can change programs like Alt Tab, but Windows Tab is a bit different, so you can add a desktop. Take a virtual desktop, open up software here. So let's just take uh, some file exploring here. And when you choose Alt Tabulator, you can choose software that's running on different uh, desktops. And if you use Windows Tabulator, you can actually change from desktops to another. So move to desktop to move to desktop to uh, um, move to desktop to and such. Again, not a big deal, but honestly something that I would again say I'd rather have it than not have it. What they're missing for me, background changes. I want my virtual desktops to be easy to spot. I need them to be looking a bit different if it's for my home use, my work use, another, another customer, another customer, stuff like that. The thing that it all shares the same de desktop background is so easy to fix that I hope they'll just fix it. So hopefully it's there before they release the product. Universal apps, amazing. This is pure amazing. Actually, it is quite amazing that you can now do a universal app that runs on Xbox, Windows Phone, and Windows desktops. So single application can run on all platforms. That's actually cool. But the thing that you can actually now run programs in Windows is not that cool when we're talking about a platform that's called Windows, which is kind of the thing that it was supposed to be doing from the early 80s. So again, I'd rather have it than not have it. I can't give like huge applause to guys being able to run software in different, uh, in different windows. But yeah, an easy thing to spot. So this one is a modern user interface application. It's running in a window. I can run like, um, let's try Valokuvat in Finnish photos. Uh, they've done a few changes. First of all, they're running in Windows. They did add this in the latest build because people, were people wanted to have this full screen button, which was missing. Uh, you used to have this, say, uh, you used to have this application menu before. So there was, um, let's try, I think that's the one that you're seeing on the screen. You see this small button here that's now replacing what you used to do with either right clicking or swiping from below the surface or using the settings charms bar. Okay, so that's the same thing now with application commands. New store. There's a lot of cool stuff in the store, which might not be something that we are able to go through here all, but quick browse of it. Enterprise App Store inside of the actual App Store. So Microsoft will give you the ability to build your company's own store without any infrastructure. Uh, you will be able to use volume li licensing finally. So you will purchase licenses for 100 users for this application. Uh, these licenses can be reused later on, making it a lot easier for big companies. Now they have promised that you can deploy apps in your images. You can deploy them with SCCM, MDT. So ability to actually do that enterprise-wise as well. And one big change will be that there's a single store that's going to service Xbox, Windows, Windows Phone. So just a single store. Should make the developers more happy with universal apps, of course. That's just an example that I stole from a fellow MVP, so it's not mine in any way. But uh, you can just manage your inventory and you can see the, no the um, apps here. You can also manage the licenses for apps, see how many of them are used, if you want to see them in your company's own store or not. So it should look something like this in the future. Biggest mistake of announcing Windows 10 is not here. But the thing is, the way Joe Belfiore said it, that was horrifying. Honestly, the guy starts to talk about, we believe Windows 10 is something better than ever before. 
we believe Windows 10 might be what we've always, what everyone has always been looking for. First, we'd like to serve the enterprise customers, and everyone's like, yeah, 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 you forgot us totally in 8.1, so yeah, nice, nice, nice. So, enterprise people, IT pros around the world, you can now have a transparent command prompt. <laughs> I was almost like, well, it, the feed wasn't, the um, video stream wasn't working that well either, but I, like, like, almost like, I'm not gonna see this. The bad thing was that why the heck if they, wanna people, if they want people to start using PowerShell, why didn't they use PowerShell? Because it's using the exactly same conhost.exe, which they're actually talking about. Why don't they say that PowerShell is now even easier used than ever? And everyone would have been happy. But now they start with like, you know, we were talking about that old PowerShell, but now we thought we'd make a super command prompt. <laughs> like we might call it 4DOS or something. So. You should remember that um, if you use Process Explorer, this should be something that you know, but if you use Process Explorer and, for example, start these tools here. So let's start um, cmd.exe, let's start powershell.exe, here we go. Both look kind of the same, that is because they are the same, meaning that if you go here and see the actual file cmdxe is run inside of a conhost.exe and powershell.exe is run in the same conhost.exe. So that's the thing that's actually changed. So these new settings that you can do with a command prompt, they would have been a lot nicer for IT pros to approach if they would have just marketed it differently, saying that this will make you your life easier with PowerShell. There's actually stuff that you've all been, all, I'd say most of you have probably been looking for. So you can actually do uh, line wrapping properly. You, can, you don't have to cut paste these rectangular areas from your command prompt. You can do control V, you know, paste works. That's awesome. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. I, I honestly didn't, f at first I was kind of wondering like, why would I like to take my command prompt and the coolest thing being that I would be able to go to properties, experimental, and start changing the opacity of it. First of all, I thought it might be quite cool because it, I, had a, I, had a blue, I had a blue background so it looked like Commodore 64. <laughs> so I was honestly like, wow, that's like kind of cool. <laughs> but um, like, honest, you don't want to start making enterprise people happy by saying that this thing, you know, we developed this 20 years ago and now we're going to make it transparent. <laughs> Windows 10. <laughs> Got to be kidding me. Works better on PowerShell. Um, and some, I, I had a script. I have to. There's a guy, most of you might have heard his name even mentioned earlier uh, in a keynote or something, but there's a, a, a real PowerShell people that I've been talking to that actually said that that's really cool. Like, why is it cool? But they said it's cool because if you, for example, take a, let's say you go to uh, technetmicrosoft.com script center. If you go here, then you find a nice uh, PowerShell script you think you're going to copy. And uh, you want to see it there, and then you want to start working, it, working with it with your PowerShell. And you can do make it transparent. Experimental, transparent at least a bit, like that. Yeah, sure, here we go, Windows PowerShell. So you can actually start typing and see the script. I, I'm not a PowerShell dude, so I was like, w wow. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. But they seem to think it's fine. I, I honestly first thought that they had to be kidding that this is like the coolest thing in Windows 10. Well, anyway, it's the conhost.exe that gets better. PowerShell is easier to use than ever. Do not promote this as being a better command prompt, okay? Project Spartan. If you want to use Project Spartan, you can only use the motor that it's using, I mean, the engine that it's using. 
So there's a, you just go to your IE on Windows 10, type about colon flags, and you can change and enable the experimental web platform features to get the Spartan engine from there. But basically, the Spartan browser itself will be a future release with Windows. So it's not on the current builds and probably not even on the next one. Uh, I'm so sad that we have to see the modern IE go away. I would have liked to have it. It was such a great product. I'd, I'd be happy replacing it with anything, basically. I, <laughs> like anything. <laughs> I hate it. But uh, anyway, it's hopefully going to replace the horrible Windows modern applica I, IE modern application. Uh, some people will use IE 11 because Spartan is supposed to be the lightest ever. It will be missing engines. So that means that you will actually have quite a lot less of compatibility for old things. So that's why you will have to probably use both the IE 11 next to it and the new Spartan. But, but that's a good call from Microsoft, if you ask me. Good call. All customers are complaining. IE is slow and at the same time complaining that compatibility is lousy. You can't actually serve both. If you want to make a fast and fluid, nice browser, you have to get rid of the old stuff. My IE is supporting so much old engines and engine versions, document modes and stuff like that, that they will just have to clean the slate, start from the beginning. And I thank you them for that anyway. Security. Yes, there's a lot of security, but as I told you, uh, it needs to be its own session, which means that we will need to have a session about security only. So I'm going to have another session about that one. I only have a few minutes left. So just to end these things up, what's going to happen next? If you ask me, I'd say Windows 8.1 will probably be forgotten like 8 and Vista. Uh, if you've seen the market share values, the weirdest thing happened in December. Because in November, Windows, 8, uh, Windows 7 has a 50.7 percentage of the market share. Um, Windows 8.1 was a bit over 8%. Then it was Windows XP with a few tenths less. And then it was OS X with 7 point something. Luckily, Windows 8.1 was the second at least. But what happened in December? Windows XP went up the ladder again. At the end of December, Windows XP was used more than Windows 8.1. So if you have a Windows 7 with over 50% market share compared it to Windows 8.1, I'd say Windows 8.1 will just, Microsoft will just hope you don't talk about it. Just upgrade it. Windows 7 home users is to upgrade free. Windows 7 is kind of old for a home user anyway now. So it's six years old. So why not upgrade if it's free and only for one year? This thing works for home users. It's free now, next year you'll pay. <laughs> and they'll do it. Windows 7 Enterprises, mm, if they've just gone through a huge trouble of upgrading from XP to 7, and they still have time to play until 2020, not that sure. I wouldn't bet my money on it that people would be upgrading to Windows 10 that easily, if you are already running Windows 7. What happens at Microsoft? So. If you want to be at the fast level of adopting this, you need to become a Windows Insider. So how this works from now on is that Microsoft has people internally volunteering to test the new builds. They test them out. If, when they're tested out enough inside, they will be announced to the Windows Insiders through Windows Update for the fast option. And then it's used there for a few weeks, and then it'll go to the slow ones. So. That's how we will go from now on till launch. I have no idea when the launch is. They can't miss the uh, Christmas market anyway. So I'd say, I'd say it's fall something. So this year after summer might be a good guess. We can end this up because I'm out of time. Uh, I just needed to find you some cool instructions. You can go to the internet if you want to if you want to find out how to use Windows 10. There's actually good documentation because there was some guy yesterday telling me that there's no documentation. That if you go to Microsoft's website, the space is, page is empty. 
There's no documentation if you go to help. So I find this, found this old one, but it still works quite well. So uh, you can go and check it out. It actually has all the instructions for Windows 10 as well. So it is possible to create a custom program group with just the application icons you want to see. That's a new feature on the new start menu as well. Uh, in practice, it was actually often quicker to click File Run and then type the name of the program you want to run. That still applies. Uh, clicking the system box in the upper left corner also shows the application system menu. Add it to Windows 10 now with the latest build. <laughs> Windows can be resized by dragging the corners between the marked location of the window border. Works very well now with the newest build again. Uh, the only thing I was amazed was that this documentation seems to say that they have a working search for files. So I haven't found that in Windows 10 yet, but... Uh, Maybe that will be in the future builds, but you can try to search files as well. Please evaluate the session and thank you for joining me. <laughs>